Hey, what's up, everyone? Sam Shaw here, founder of Wall Street Mastermind. Really, really excited today um, to be recording this client interview for you guys uh, because today we have uh, Jacob with us, who's one of our uh, honestly rock star students who uh, absolutely crushed his recruiting process. Um, and but you know, perhaps more, more. What's more exciting is we also have Jacob's dad, Elvis, with us, and uh, really wanted to get Elvis uh, and Jacob on here together today to. Um, talk about Jacob's recruiting journey because I think um, uh, Elvis is, uh, has just been, I, I've known Elvis since we started working with Jacob and uh, you know, we'll talk about kind of that story um, later on here, but Elvis has been, I can honestly say one of the, probably if not the most supportive parents that um, we've had in Wall Street Mastermind, uh, just that I've ever seen. And we've worked with a lot of students we've worked with over 1100 students at this point. And so I think a lot of times we see um, students go through the recruiting process and it's a very challenging process for them. Um, but like most parents just, you know, like parents are supportive. Obviously they want their kids to do well, but uh, I think most parents don't really know that much about the recruiting process uh, specifically when it comes to investment banking because they never worked in the industry or, and so it's not like anyone's fault, but it's just like, it's hard to help when you don't like know that much about it. Uh, but I felt like, you know, Elvis really always like went above and beyond to find different ways to um, help Jacob out, which I thought was really awesome. So anyway, I wanted to get them to come on here today, talk about Jacob's recruiting process, um, talk about how he was able to um, just have such a successful outcome, um, especially given kind of all the uh, challenges that he had to overcome in terms of, you know, the school he went to and things like that. And so um, hopefully this will be uh, you know, a helpful uh, interview for you guys and um, give you guys some insights that maybe you can apply to your own process as well. So anyway, without further ado, Jacob, Elvis, thank you guys for taking the time uh, on a Sunday morning. But uh, if you guys don't mind, maybe just introduce yourself briefly. Maybe Jacob, you go first and then Elvis, maybe you can also talk a little bit about kind of um, what your background is and then we'll just kind of dive into some questions. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us here, Sam. Um... Yeah, as I mentioned before, my name is Jacob. Uh, currently a third year at Quinnipiac. Um, I joined the Wall Street Mastermind my freshman year, my first year of college, and since then, it's definitely been a journey. Um, I've learned a lot here, not just from the coaches, but from the students that I've actually met a part of the program. And um, I feel like I owe a lot to you know everybody that helped me in this process. You know, as Sam mentioned, my dad's also been a huge help. You know, it's kind of kept me up when I felt down. You know, when I wanted to give up as well. So you know, a little shout out to him. But um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll probably say later. I'm not sure Sam's want to do like a brief you know, experience walkthrough, but I could definitely go into that as well. But um, yeah, that's me. That's a little bit about me. And hi, I'm Elvis, Jacob's dad. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like Sam said, uh, I've been a little bit maybe too involved sometimes for Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I kind of when I was young. I kind of was involved in the industry a bit, so I was a little bit familiar. And, you know, uh, like Jacob, you know, I've experienced it with him. It's fun. I try to help out whenever I can. And, you know, and I, just being involved and help him out as much as I can. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, So, you know, Jacob, I mean, you joined uh, February. So it was like second semester of freshman year, I think, right? Um. And obviously, you know, you go to a non-target school, um, like you said, um, the way you found us, I think, is a bit different than most people. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think, Elvis, you were actually the one that found us and then kind of talked to Jacob about it. Like, talk to us about how that happened, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, basically, I, I kind of pretty much knew I was going to strive for investment banking going into college. Um, we did find out pretty early on as well that it would be a bit difficult considering you know, the school I was attending, you know, no offense to school, it's up a great university, lots of, you know, great faculty and students I've met there. But, you know, truth of the matter is, you know, it's not exactly a, an investment banking powerhouse. Um, right. So we did realize, you know, we, we, you know, we had to look up some resources online. I knew I had to do a lot of footwork on my own. Um, Obviously, I confided in my dad in this, you know, I told him, like, yeah, dad, this is not going to be an easy journey. You know, it's already thought to have been a hard journey. It's going to be even harder. And, you know, I mean, we both kind of looked into things, but I'm really... uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a notorious Googler. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly, Sam, how I was that I found you. might have been 
uh, you know, a, a Google search or something, but I did come across a program, uh, Wall Street Oasis, Instagram, YouTube. I saw everything. I, I I did my due diligence. You know, like always, maybe most parents, I was a bit skeptical. But I think I reached out to you kind of early, or we reached out kind of early. And once we had a conversation, I, you know, I was pretty much so. Mm. I told you, yeah, you want to do this? Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about that because um, I mean, a couple of things I want to call out here. It's like one, Jacob, you mentioned you knew you wanted to do IB early on. I think that's um, pretty critical. Actually, like you, you just mentioned it in passing, but as, I don't think most people picked up on that. But like, I think that's pretty critical, right? It's like nowadays, just given how early recruiting happens, and this is one thing that most parents don't realize is that a lot of parents think like, oh, my kid is a freshman or my kid's a sophomore, like no big deal, right? Like we we wait till senior year and then we'll start thinking about looking for jobs then because that's how most people do it for most other industries. And that's how most parents probably did it when back when they were in college and, you know, going through the job search process. Um, And what usually is kind of like a shocker for people is like these days, you know, if you want to get into like a top investment bank, you pretty much have to start applying and interviewing like halfway through sophomore year which means to prepare for that and with all the lead time that's required to build up your resume and do the networking and do the interview prep and whatever, like you basically ideally have to start freshman year, right? Which is kind of crazy because it's like my kid's 18, just went to college and probably doesn't even like most people are like, they don't even know what they want to be yet. Right. (laughs) And then it's like, you're already having to think about jobs. And so, but like the most competitive candidates now, that's what they're all doing. So it's like, if you're not thinking about, investment banking until junior year or senior year and not saying like then you can't get in but it's going to be probably 10 times harder you know especially if you can't get the summer internship between your junior and senior year and uh, also the quality of the bank that you usually end up at if you start that late it's going to be a lot like it's going to be a lot worse because typically all the best banks get filled up first right so i think that's like kind of really the first big call out for people is like jacob started working on this as early as freshman year right and that's I think that's a big part of the reason why he was able to be so successful, especially coming from um, a non-target school, right? Uh, but I guess the other part that I want to kind of dive into then is, you know, I was coming back to you to so do a bunch of Googling. You you, I, you probably got targeted by like an ad or something because of your Google search history or something. Um, but, you know, there's so many resources out there these days. Like that was not the case Um even back in my days, you know, and I graduated in 2008. So that was 15 years ago. Um, back then we didn't have all the resources that we had now, like definitely nothing like Wall Street Mastermind. Um, even like the most popular interview guys that everyone uses now were, I think like, I don't think they were a thing yet back then, or maybe they had like just come out. Um, but like fast forward to today, there's so many resources out there. Like you said, Wall Street Oasis, Breaking into Wall Street, like Wall Street Prep, blah, 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 blah. Right. Like I'm sure you came across all the different options. Um, so yeah, you hopped on a call with us. Yeah, you did your due diligence. Um, yeah, you were skeptical in the beginning. But like, what made you say, like, okay, out of all the options that I could possibly choose to help Jacob, like this one is the one that I want to go with. Like, because I feel like it's just almost like people have so many choices now, sometimes they don't really know what to do, you know. Well, I felt like your program was the most hands-on where, you know, a lot of the other, other choices, other um, things out there, you it was just like, here's the work, it's on you to do it, mm-hmm. you know? There's no, you know, there's nobody looking over you, there's nobody for you, you know, you might be able to ask a question, you might get an answer, maybe not, who knows when, but with you, you know, the fact that you also had like a community where it was not just you, it was also other students like him, and, you know, you guys would just help each other. Mm. And you know, there was a sense of, you know, you know, like a group. It's like, you know, again, coming from a non-target school where you probably didn't have nobody to talk to about this because, you know, not many people in school probably went through the process. I felt like, you know, Wall Street Mastermind provided like a, you know, way for him to, talk, you know, to talk, besides me, because I was the only person he, he would speak to, speak mm. to about it. So, you know, it provided like a sense of like a, a community for him for, you know, Oh, I don't understand this. Let me just throw it out there. Put the question out there. Within minutes, you get an answer either from you or even from other students chiming in. You know, and I think that's invaluable. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point, which is, I think when we started Wall Street, before we started Wall Street Match Point, no one had, had, was actually doing what we're doing. It was just kind of, uh, kind of surprising, but I think for the longest time, all the resources out there were kind of just, here's a PDF file with, you know, 400 questions and answers and just go study this on your own. Right. Or, um, and what a lot of students usually end up doing is just, they memorize the answers to those questions without really understanding what they're memorizing. And um, obviously when they get, go into the actual interviews, the interviewers are not going to just ask you the exact same questions that they know you've already memorized because they've also read those same guides. Like everybody reads the same two or three guides. Um, and then so students get tripped up in the interviews when the interviewer switches just like a small part of the question or uses a different number or different assumption or maybe like dress it up differently. Right. And so a lot of people struggle with that. Um, and then I think the other thing too is what we realize is like, okay, like everyone's so focused on like the technical interview aspect of things. Um, but like, there's so many other moving parts that go into what it takes to be successful in the recruiting process, which I'm sure like Jacob, we'll probably talk about, we'll get talk about that in a second here, but, um, and no one was really helping with that. Like, how to build up your resume, how to get like relevant experience, how to network with bankers, um, all the things that come before the interview that determine whether you actually even get the interview or not. Uh, and, and so I feel like a lot of people spend all this time memorizing answers to a fixed set of questions. And then they, one, they're not going to get to ask those questions if they get the interviews, but two, they don't even end up getting the interview anyway. And then so it just becomes like kind of a waste of time, like putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Right. So um, that's why we wanted to kind of have this um, more hands-on model and not, not like hands-on, like, Hey, we'll work with you like on an hourly basis for an hour or for two hours or whatever. I mean, like, I think you can, yes, get hourly tutors too, but the reality is like, it must make recruiting is such a long process that goes on for months, if not years. I mean, you recruited Jacob for, I mean, when did you get your offer? You got your offer probably saw yeah, some, some. Yeah, at some point sophomore year, second semester, right? Yeah. Actually, it was I, a summer. Yeah, but a summer, sophomore, summer. So it was like so it was like a little over a year. Like we had to work with you for a little over a year, which is a very long process, right? And so so we just want to take a different approach to it, basically. It's like more of a long term long term uh mentorship approach where you know we're actually working with you as opposed to just saying you know, here's a list of questions and memorize it. Cause I think that's like overly simplifying. Right. Um, so that makes, that makes sense. Um, you talked about a little bit of us about like being skeptical in the beginning, like what were you skeptical about? Cause I think a lot of parents are right in the beginning, rightfully so, because there's a lot of, to be honest, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of garbage out there these days. Right? And so yeah. like, what were you skeptical, about, uh, skeptical about specifically? And then like, how did you overcome that skepticism? I guess. But you know, of course, you know, of course, there's the financial commitment, you know, and you know, I just wanted to know what exactly what does that entail? What do I get for that? You know, what am I paying for exactly? You know, it's a lot of you know, it's one thing to see a price and then pay, and I know what you're gonna get. Mm. You know, so you know, I think after the call with you and after you know, you gave us you know the lowdown, I guess, you know, it was you know, it was pretty obvious, you know, and. You know, I did look around and, I, you know, I saw some comments. I saw, I saw, you know, you know, obviously you're always going to have your negative comments, but I think the positive outweighed the negative, you know? Mm. So, you know, I, I, I was, I was content after my conversation with you personally. So, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, what about you, Jacob? Like what were, obviously you were part of the process um, when we were having those initial conversations. Um what was going through your mind and like, were you and your dad kind of on the same page in terms of like, yeah, this is kind of the program that I would like to do or like, what, what were your thoughts there? Or were you also kind of skeptical? Like, <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess I would say I was a bit skeptical because, you know, it, yes, financial commitment, but it's also, you know, a time commitment. I, you know, I'm, I'm someone that like, you know, if I'm going to commit to something, I, I got to be part of it, especially something like this. But, you know, I de would definitely, I remember this super vividly. It was, uh, I'm not sure if it was the informational call or if this is a separate call, but we were together and you actually pulled up. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I even get into that, I did want to mention what I was probably most skeptical about is like, how effective is it? Like, does it really work? Like, yeah, maybe 
maybe this guy places a couple of kids, but you know, how effective is this? And I mm -hmm. do remember, you know, this, this, this vanished. I thought vanished when you had us on a meeting and you actually had data, you had charts of kids in each year when they joined placements into each tier of the banks. And I was like, wow, really broken it up. You, you, you gave us an estimate of how many students have been a part of the program, how much it's been growing. Um, and you know, that's not something I could have found online. You know, that's something you kind of dug in. We just showed us, um, mm -hmm. it was very professional. Um, then definitely, you know, kind of resolved the worry in my mind. That probably was my biggest skepticism, but that definitely, you know, helped banish thought. That's funny. Um, yeah, like I'm a numbers guy, right? So I like to, uh, I think data, uh, and I, I, I think more logically. And so personally, when I make purchase decisions, that's, I'm the same way. It's like, if I can see actual data, then that makes me feel a lot better. Um, but I think also, um, it's funny that you say that because sometimes it's like, if the results are too good, then people kind of become more skeptical because they're like, this, 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 this is too good to be true or whatever. Like we hear that sometimes and it's like kind of a double-edged sword. <laughs> so it's like- Something that also did it for me was your testimonials. Mm -hmm. you actually, I saw other students and I saw uh, videos of other parents as well, but mostly the students, you know, and I think I, I love to hear the stories. I loved hearing the stories about, you know, the guy from the non-target that had, maybe like a substandard GPA, how he was able to, you know, to get in with your help, you know? So when you hear stories like that, it's like, well, so something has to work, you know, so something yeah. has to be working. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. I think, um, cause you know, you know, you know, you mentioned like, obviously there's some negative comments online, right? Like if you go, uh, if you go on like certain, uh, if you look hard enough, like there's, uh, always going to be the haters that say like, Oh, this program, must be a scam or this program is whatever. Like they just teach you stuff that you can already find on Google. Um, yeah. The funny thing, and I, th I do think a lot of people get scared off by that actually. And so I think like, you know, the, the thing that I want to say about you guys is you guys still did your own due diligence. I think a lot of people don't even bother to do the due diligence once they see any negative comments. Cause they're like, okay. Like they, they automatically just, and I get it. It, it. It's a scary uh, thing, right? It's like, oh, well, I'm not even going to waste my time looking into this. Um, but unfortunately, like in this day and age with the internet, and obviously now you guys are on the other side, so you had the benefit of hindsight, but it's like truth, truly like anyone can say anything these days online. And it's like, you know, we live in a world where Democrats say one thing, Republicans say another thing, and both sides say the other side is lying. And like, you read the news and everyone's like fake news and you don't know like who's telling the truth, right? And um, I think here it's kind of the same, which is we have our supporters, we have our detractors. But you know, the thing I always tell people is that when you live in a world like this, where there's two sides that are saying like completely opposite things, one of the most important skills that is actually required is just your own critical thinking skills in terms of like being able to sift through the bullshit, excuse my language and like get to the bottom of like, who's telling the truth. Right. And the way I, I kind of like tell people to think about it is like, think about like, everyone's usually just like self-interested, right? Like everyone's gonna like, just look out for their own best interests. And so if you, if you look at like who's on each side, other people that are saying negative things about a program are people that are online and they admit that they've never used the program. They admit that, yeah, we talked to the company, thought it was too expensive. These guys are total scammers, blah, 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 even though they never use it. So I, I don't know how they know that we're scammers, but that's fine. Um, on the other side is to your point, these testimonials of students that have actually gone through the program and have already gotten jobs. And, you know, they're, they're like publicly endorsing a program that they went through. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, the people that decide not to use the program, they don't want you to use the program because then it makes their job harder to get a job because they're not using the program. Right. And so like what they, they have no incentive to be like, Hey, I'm not going to use the program, but everyone else should go use the program. Cause it sounds great. Versus the people that have already gone through it and already gotten their jobs. Like, like to you, Jacob, like it doesn't really matter that much if someone else decides to use this program or not. Cause like you already have your job. Right. And also, by the way, we haven't even talked about like, you know, um, the outcome was like, you, you got a, you got an amazing offer, right. Which we can talk about in a second, but like, you got an amazing offer and 
someone like you, who's got a bright future, you got all your success ahead of you. Like you're not going to go out there and publicly endorse a program. That's like not legitimate. Like, what do you have to gain by doing that? In fact, you have a lot to lose, you know, um, if, if, if you lie about that kind of stuff. And so it's just like, that's what I mean by critical thinking skills is like, if you really just thought about who's saying what and why are they saying those things, does it make sense that they're saying those things, then it should be pretty easy to like really get to the bottom of like what's real or, or, or what's not right. Or, or even just like at least do your own due diligence and talk to the team, talk to the people that are running the program, talk to other students that have done the program, like, you know, talk to like real human beings as opposed to like jumping to conclusions. Right. Um, Elvis, I feel like you have something you want to say, but. <clears throat> uh, no, I was, when you first started, you know, talking about, you know, the doubt, it, it's so easy for you just to jump on a call. I think, I think I, I saw your, I saw your ads or, or I did my research. I think I spoke to you the, that same day and, and it took me minutes. You know, I think you, I, I sent an email or something. I think you set up a poll for the following day and I think you spoke the next day and that's it. You know, that, that it took, you know, 24 hours maybe for me to, you know, get what I needed to know to make a decision. And a yeah. lot of people, you know, and that, and that should apply to everything, you know, buying a car, <laughs> choosing a school, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and ask questions yeah for yeah. sure yeah doing your due diligence is important and, and, and like i mean i i really view this as an investment and i think most parents and students that join our program view it as an investment too right as in like it's like picking a college that's an investment right you pay a bunch of money to go to school with the hopes that it will improve your future job prospects at least that's how most people think about it um, and so that's an investment as in you're expecting to see some sort of return on that investment, whether it's a good return or a bad return, like to be determined. Right. But just like any investment you make, like you're not going to invest a bunch of money in something without actually doing your homework. Right. Or hopefully you're not. Like, I mean, some people, when they buy stocks, they just kind of gamble, but like, like the right way to do it is like to actually study what you're investing in and like get as much information as you can and then make an informed decision. And you know, this is kind of no different, right? It's just like, we, we have always, a lot of times, like the students will hop on calls with us and the parents don't. Um, but we always love it when the parents actually hop on the call with us too, because then they can ask questions themselves and they can, you know, be informed about how the recruiting process works and what exactly it is that their kids are going to get out of this program, as opposed to just like writing the check. A lot of parents just write the check and, they don't really know like what they're writing a check for. Right. Which is like, which is fine. But, um, but also like some parents just say, no, like I won't write the check. And it's almost like the way I think about it is it's kind of weird because you already invested so much in your kid's education over the last, whatever, you know, 10, 10 to 15, 10 to 12 years since they've been in school. And the whole point of you doing that is to set them up for the best future possible. And then now you're like, you know, on the five yard line. And there's just like one last thing that you're deciding whether it's worth doing or not. And then like, you won't do your due diligence about that. You know, it's like, why, why, why stop here? Right. So, um, but anyway, I, I guess uh, we were alluding to this earlier already. Uh, I usually do this right at the beginning because people always want to know, but forgot to do it on this call, Jacob, like people always want to know, like, what was the outcome of your recruiting process? Um, and like, I guess let's start there. Like what, 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 what offer did you get? Or, um, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing. <clears throat> do you, do you want me more so to kind of dig deep into like what I did to get to it or just the, the outcome itself? Uh, let's talk about the outcome first and let's, and then we're definitely going to get to like kind of what you did too. Yeah. So yeah, I got an offer at a top three bulls bracket bank. Um, you know, very good global firm, very excited. Um, definitely owe a lot to it, you know, you know, starting from this program, people I've met here as well. Um, it's been definitely a stressful adventure, but at the same time, you know, even throughout the process of getting the offer, I feel like I learned a lot already. And the fact that I'm in, I'm, you know, in the process to learn a whole lot more, it's, it's a bit exciting, but yeah, um, it was definitely hard, but you know. And I just want to add to that. He actually did get multiple offers. Yeah, so, I got a call. He got a, he got a few, yeah. 
How many how many offers do you end up getting again? I think I know. Uh, I got three. So I got the one I have right now, and I got two middle market offers um right before the summer. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so that's awesome. Obviously, um a lot of people are just happy to have one, but you know, it's good to have some people are able to get multiple offers and actually have the choice, which is always nice. Um I assume your dad was the first person you told. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I remember, I remember getting off the phone. But actually, when I when I got the offer, um, for this one, um, we were in the car, we we're in a road trip, we we're heading, we we're heading, was on the way back. We were heading down. We we're heading down to Texas. You know, I was looking into some schools for next year. I'm going to transfer next year. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was on the phone. You know, I, I didn't know the number, and you know, I, I answered it, and the the lady sounded very familiar, and I'm like, wait a minute. I feel like I know this girl's name. And then, you know, the next few census come out. Hi, you know, I'm from XYZ. You know, I just want to, you know, it was a very, it was, this year was very hard. You know, I, I, at first I thought I didn't get it. And yeah. she's like, congratulations, you got it. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. And I'm like, so excited. I hang up and I just start flipping out in the car and I tell them, and they're like, super, super, super excited. Yeah, that's, oh, that's awesome. What did that feel like, Elvis, when you found out? I mean, it was a relief. You know, we, we were on pins and needles, uh, you know, but, you know, I was excited. I was confident. I know he prepared. I know he had a good experience because he was actually there this summer as yeah. well at that place. So um, so he, he felt good about it. He told me he did. And, you know, I think we were hoping. We were, like, expecting it. Yeah. You know. So that yeah. would have been a surprise if he didn't get it. But, yeah. <laughs> what about when you, like, zoom out um, and kind of, like, look back on this entire journey? And this could be for both of you, but obviously you guys have both put a lot of um, time and effort, just invested a lot of time and effort and even financial resources into this goal for, and you guys, I feel like you guys were, the two of you together were kind of like marching towards this goal for a while. Right. And so uh, what does it feel like to, when you like finally come out the other side of it? Um, I don't know, like kind of what outcome you guys expected um, when you were first going into it, but like, was this kind of like what you expected? Was this like more than what you expected? Lesson? Like kind of talk talk about that a little bit. <laughs> I, I yeah, I will say um I guess kind of coming into the process, um I definitely I guess have lower had lower expectations compared to, you know, what's actually happened. Like, you know, when I I think I I briefly touched on it earlier, but you know, finding out pretty early on that I want to go into banking was definitely helpful in the fact like okay yeah I, you know I I got a little bit of time or so I thought it turns out I was kind of probably just on time <laughs> and um I you know I it, I also did realize like I had you know I don't want to say weaknesses but I definitely had some things that um definitely kind of I guess put me behind um the majority of candidates I'm going to be you know going against for these positions mm -hmm. so you know I, I in my mind I subconsciously I kind of put you know top old bracket even the leap boutique you know offers like out of the question like i thought i would have you know not settle for a middle market firm you know don't get me wrong you know great companies is very great companies that operate in the middle market but you know i thought that was probably going to be like my tip top considering i'm coming from a non-target mm -hmm. um but as i went as i went on through the process you know i you know i worked hard i really try to stack my resume really try to keep the grades up um networked as much as possible which is also very key um, I started to gain a lot more confidence in myself and, you know, I started getting in processes I didn't think I'd ever get into. Mm. And yeah, I, it, it definitely did change throughout. Like, you know, I think my sophomore year, end of sophomore year, probably mid sophomore, year, I was like, wow, I could probably touch a bit higher, you know, let's go for mm. it. And, you know, I mean, I always, and you actually say this a lot. Um, and I always say this to, you know, the mentees and the accountability buddies, you know, cast a wide net, you know, you never know. Um, so yeah, I made sure I networked everywhere. Even when I thought I, even when I didn't think I could do it, I still tried, you know, I'd send out emails to them anyways. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was definitely a very stressful, but exciting process. You kind of learn a lot about yourself. Um, yeah, but, for sure. But, uh, what about you, Elvis? What were your expectations? Um, honestly, like him initially, uh, I just wanted him to get in somewhere, anywhere. And I figured, like, if he gets in anywhere, he could work his way up, you know, lateral his way to probably something better. But as he progressed and I saw that, you know, he was learning the technicals, 
I think Jacob has always been like a very good people person. So I wasn't very, uh, I know he will be likable. And I know that's not something that's spoke, spoken much about, but I think it's, it's a big factor when you're interviewing, especially, you know, in a job where you're going to spend so many hours next to people, yeah. you know, they got to be able to like you. <laughs> you know? So I think he had that going for him. But as he learned, you know, the, the technical material and, and I saw him like, wow, he's really getting this. And, you know, I'm like, okay. And, you know, the email started coming in for, you know, interviews. I'm like, okay, well, okay, nice. You know, and I think that gave him a lot of confidence. And, you know, he just continued to network and, you know, he, he put a lot into the network. He put a lot of hours into that. So, you know, and I think he had some, came across some people that were willing to help. And, you know, that's why I think that's very invaluable. Yeah. Going out there and speaking back. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I mean, I think, um, I think that's such a good takeaway, uh, good takeaway for people, which is, I think a lot of times in the beginning, especially before you've actually done the work, it's really easy to have a lot of stories or, um, you know, or I'll call them like limiting beliefs about yourself or like what you may or may not be capable of. And that's just because like, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And you know, and that could be a lot of things. It could be like, I go to a non-target school that could for some, for, for other people, not you necessarily, it could be, you know, oh, my GPA is not good enough. Or uh, I don't know, like I'm not a people's person or I'm too shy or I don't know, whatever, right? Like I have no experience on my resume, like all valid um, concerns, but also like all things that can be overcome. Right. Um, and different people kind of look at, um, a lot of this is, I feel like it comes down to mindset, which is like, you know, you could like some people will say, well, I'm a non-target school kid, so I can't get in. And then other people will be like, well, have, has there ever been any non-target school kids that have gotten into banking? Yes. Okay. Well then if they can, then why can't I? Right. And so that's like two totally opposite ways of looking at the exact same condition. Uh, but I think the other thing too, is just like, as you actually put in the work and as you actually start doing it and as you start to actually see progress and you start to get the small wins along the way, then your confidence will naturally start to build. And then you don't have to go from like zero to a hundred on like day one, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a process, but like, but you got to put in the work first. And so um, I think a lot of people make the mistake of just kind of disqualifying themselves or not putting in the work or, um, or, or, or some people too, like they put in the work, but because they're not doing it the right way, so they're not seeing the re results along the way, or they're not getting those small wins that help them build up the confidence, which is like, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you have to do a bunch of trial and error along the way, which is how most people do it actually, then it's more likely that you're going to see um, more setbacks along the way than, than wins, right? And then that's going to just kind of like deflate your entire... Um, confidence or you know like sometimes like will stop you in your tracks from actually being able to like get to where you want to go right and i think that's where having like mentors or coaches to like who have been there done that and can like guide you through the process doesn't mean it's going to be easy doesn't mean like you, you know you, doesn't mean like it's a, like you still have to do so much work right like we didn't do any of the work for you we just like taught you how to do it but you still have to like we're the coach you're the athlete you still have to go out and put in the practice reps, you start to go out and play the game and win the game. And, and then you lose some games, but, but then like, ultimately like you win more than you lose. And that's how you actually end up building up the confidence that you need slowly. And then like step-by-step, step, eventually you, you start to kind of move the goalposts a little bit. It's like, you know, initially, Oh yeah, maybe just, I just want to get in. And it's like, okay. Actually, you know, like maybe a bull, uh, middle market bank. Oh, actually maybe I can do a bulge back or elite boutique. But, oh, actually. Oh, now, now I'm ending up at like a top three bank. You know, it's like, that, that that's kind of that's a beautiful thing but like you have to work you have to you have to put in the work to to make that happen right so i think that's that's really amazing i know how much work you put into so i think that's probably like a good segue too into um like what what was the work exactly i guess um and actually before we even talk about that like you because you joined february of sophomore year or sorry freshman year Prior to that, you had known you wanted to do banking already, obviously. Had you done anything else uh, prior to joining Wall Street Mastermind in terms of just like preparation or networking or any sort of, you know, thing rec related to recruiting on your own? Or was Wall Street Mastermind kind of like the first 
thing that you kind of did, like you, 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 you decided to join Wall Street Mastermind and then you started doing the work in earnest. Like, how was that for you? I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, joining Wall Street Mastermind might have been the, I guess, the first real big step I kind of made towards recruitment. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's not like I was sitting on my butt all day. You know, I definitely was doing a lot of research into the industry, you know, ways I can do this and that. Um, surprisingly, there was actually some things we could apply, I could apply to as a freshman, um, you know, like, you know, like synopsiums, like, you know, info sessions. And that's pretty much what, you know, that that's all I had really done up to that point, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. it's been so long, but I do remember like, it wasn't until I joined, um, that like, I got, I got more educated on what I exactly should do. Um, mm -hmm. and I think put it best, you know, you know, you're one doesn't join this pro program and magically get an offer in a year and a half. You still need to roll up your sleeve. You still need to do the legwork. You just have a lot more people to talk to and resources to kind of reflect with, um, to, you know, obviously increase your chances. Um, but you still need to put the hours and you need to study. You need to be able to reach out. If I was in this program, and I didn't reach out to anybody. I guarantee I probably wouldn't have done as good, you know? Um, yeah. but yeah, it wasn't until I joined the program when I really, you know, started putting in the legwork. I remember, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think one of the first sessions you had after we joined, you told me to show you my resume. And like the first thing you did was just zoom out and you said, you see all that white? And then we're like, yeah. And then you're like, yeah, we, we got to fill that in. And then, you know, <laughs> that's, when, that's when I started chasing internships, you know, putting stuff on my resume pretty early on. Um, um, Not too long after that. Yeah, it was summer going into my sophomore years when I started networking um like, yeah from then on it was just heavy on that part but yeah it, it was I, this probably was my spark into like mm. real life. got it that's awesome um <clears throat> i guess let's dive a little bit deeper into that then so because i think there was like so there were so many things you had to work on once you joined right i would say probably <clears throat> the four major areas are probably beefing up your resume which you kind of alluded to already uh, you also alluded to having to do a ton of networking and then the third and fourth parts are, or we can lump them together, which is really interview prep, both on the behavioral side and the technical side. Right. Um, I don't know if you think there are any other, you know, major areas that you have to work on, but, um, how did you kind of tackle each of those things? And then I think maybe for you, Elvis too, like, obviously I, th I feel like you were, um, kind of there along the way like you know seeing kind of all the things that jacob was doing too um it would be interesting to hear your perspective too on, on like kind of how you went about it and, and what your thoughts are on that but jacob let's start with you though <clears throat> so i think you're right 100 percent um beefing up the resume um you know you mentioned the behavioral and technicals one thing i would also oh yeah the networking as well one thing i mean i guess it's i want to kind of add to it i think it's just it's the bare minimum but it's also the grades so that's another important thing for everyone is just like you know when you're doing all this hard work it's also important to make sure your gpa is good because at the end of the day if it's have, having a very low gpa can definitely hurt you in the process so that, that's definitely something else but in terms of, i guess in the recruiting yeah i guess technically it's kind of outside of that stage but yeah so um i guess first i did prioritize and beefing on my resume um you know, like I mentioned before, you took a look at it. You said, I think it'd be a good idea if you looked into some opportunities. That's when I learned about search funds. I think I might have heard of them briefly, but you kind of went into depth on how much they can help you, how can, you know, possibly differentiate you from people who don't have experience, especially at such an early year. You know, I was a freshman at the time. Um, and I think after that is when I started looking into the behaviorals, I was looking at the behavioral modules. Um, that was after I got to the networking modules, but like I mentioned before, I didn't really start the networking until my sophomore summer. I didn't want to reach out a bit too early. Um, and it wasn't until technicals. It's weird because, you know, you can learn. Sometimes you learn some of the foundations in class. However, depending on your school's curriculum, because I've spoken with other kids in the program, it definitely differs. And I know from my school, you get to learn a little bit of the foundations but it can be tricky because some of the financial concepts, especially when it comes to valuation or financial statement analysis, what they teach you in school is not really how it goes exactly with recruiting. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for me to grasp the difference between those two, you know, those two topics. 
like, yes, maybe I'm talking about a discounted cash flow analysis in, in my class and in my technical studying, but there's a specific way my professor wants me to do it that he teaches us and the specific way that it should probably be spoken about in an, in an interview process. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely super important. Um, didn't think it was something I had to think about, but um, I think it was a very important differentiator in my process. But yes, I would say resume was first for me. Um, you know, obviously keeping the grades up, networking happened a little bit after, um, behavioral and technical, I really started grinding, you know, probably, well, behavioral, I, I was really working on, I feel like, I feel like my summer and freshman, sorry, second, freshman uh, semester, and then, but technical, I really delved deep in my sophomore mm -hmm. semester, you know, when I started getting a little bit more blend for my class, that actually made sense to kind of coincide with. So I want to talk, talk about that for a second, what you just said about what's being taught in school versus what's the way you actually need to apply these concepts in the interview being different. I think a perfect example is what you said, which is like, for example, you might take a um, accounting class at school, which teaches you about the three financial statements, what's the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. But then the way they teach it is um, not like in the way that investment bankers think about accounting. It's almost like the accounting professor is teaching it in a way that assumes that, Hey, if people in this class want to go and become an accountant, then this is how accountants speak the language, which is not actually how investment bankers speak the language, even though it's kind of about, it's all about the same financial statements, but they talk about it very differently. Right. Um, but I guess like, so that's a really good example, but like, I mean, Elvis, I, I would love to get your perspective on this. I think a lot of, I don't know how you thought about this, but a lot of parents um, will also say like, well, you're, you're already going to school, so like, and I'm already paying so much money for school, so like, why don't you just use the resources that you already have at school to help you with recruiting, right? Did you ever think about that, or did you ever tell Jacob to do that, or? Um, well, I knew that he was attending a non-target school, so mm -hmm. I knew, and I actually, early on, I did, a, I did some research as to any alums that came out of the school that are invest in investment banking, mm -hmm. so, you know, that probably gave me a sense of you know the school is obviously not focused you know you have target school that focus on on teaching things a certain way because they know a lot of their kids are going for investment banking i know that wasn't the case for him so i mean i mean me as a father i i, I guess i might be a little bit different because i actually know some of these things <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um um I, I just pushed them i'm like I, and i just like make sure like hey you did this where, where, where are you in your modules or you know, how's your networking? And I would try to help them like with a lot of the grunt admin work as well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I was just making sure he was on track. You know, did you do this? Uh, how, how, are, how are you with this? Or, you know, hey, you got two weeks off. Maybe, you know, let's focus on this. Yeah. But, so yeah. basically, basically you actually, I don't think most parents do this, but you actually one, well, you knew the difference between a target school versus non-target school. Target schools obviously have more resources than a non-target school. But two, you went a step further and you actually, I don't know, you probably just went on LinkedIn to do this. I don't know. But like you went on LinkedIn and looked up like how many people from his school actually ended up successfully breaking into investment banking just to get a sense for like how likely is it to get in from his school. And I guess you probably didn't find that many people. Is that what happened? I just seen maybe close to 20 in span of you know the last 20 years probably okay got it so that's not a lot it's like one a year a lot of them are like in be regional, regional huh? a lot of them are in like in regional boutiques well most of them were at regional boutiques got it um so obviously for other parents who have no idea what we're talking about regional boutiques are basically just like very small regional banks that are not like the household names that you usually think of like when you read the news, you read about Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. Like those are bulge bracket banks, like top tier banks. Regional boutique banks are like small mom and pop shops that like most people don't know about, which is obviously less prestigious and don't pay as well and don't have all the great exit opportunities and so on and so forth. So, okay. But long story short though, you- There are some that are in, in, in reputable places and he did reach out. Many of them were helpful. Yeah. yeah. But basically it's like you found 20 people- in the last yeah. 20 years or whatever, which is very little and not all of them are like kind of at the 
uh, are all at like the caliber of the banks that you would hope to get into basically. Okay. So I think bottom line is, yeah, doing, doing the um, due diligence is again, really important just to uh, be honest with yourself and be realistic. And I do, I understand the parents perspective too. It's like college tuition is crazy these days, right? It's like, it's one of the, when it comes to inflation, like if you look at the line for college tuition, it's like the highest inflation out of like all the expenses that you you, you can uh, pay for. It's like almost like a straight line up, but, uh, and then, so you would expect that these schools would, you know, do what's necessary to help your kids get the jobs that they want. But for whatever reason, that's just not the case. Right. Or not, it's not always the case. I would say even for people that go to the target schools, like you go to Ivy league school or Warren or whatever, um, still a lot of, uh, there's definitely easier and better chance of getting in, but a lot of the kids, there like there's still more kids there that don't get in than the kids that actually get in right so it's still not like a guarantee that you'll get in just because you go to warden or something um but also i think like we've worked with enough warden kids to know like if you go to a school like warden too like then your bar is also different like a lot of the warden kids they're not happy with just getting in they want to get into like the best bank possible because i'm paying eighty thousand dollars a year or whatever you know um and so a lot of the warden kids come to us, not, I'm picking on warden, but like a lot of the target school kids come to us because it's the same thing. It's not like, I'm not worried about just getting in, but it's like, how do I get into the best banks possible? So it's like for everyone, they have like a floor and a ceiling. I want to say like based on their profile. And it's like, how do we get you as close to your ceiling as possible as opposed to like the floor? Cause you're, the floor obviously will be like, you don't get in at all. But the ceiling is like, okay, you didn't just get in, but you got into like, say a top three bank, right? So, um, okay, so that makes sense. So like, uh, obviously like it was not target school. So, you know, you understood that um, having more help is always um, useful. I guess one other question too, then like kind of related, another common thing that we hear from parents, uh, not all parents, but I think maybe like the more old school parents, um, they'll say things like, it's just kind of macho, but like, well, if you can't do it on your own, then you don't deserve it. Like, what, what do you, what do you, what kind of reaction do you have when you hear that school of thought, I guess? I think that's just the wrong way to think about it. I mean, if that was, if that was the case, you could make the argument, if you can't pay for school, then go or something, you know? Right. You know, I mean, we're parents, so we do what we can to push them as far as we can. And, you know, and I think it's, it falls on us to just give them as much as you know, as much support as we can, and and, and it's like you say, it, it's an investment in, in, in his future. And you know, well, you buy you buy him a car. You does he really need a car? But you know, <laughs> I, I think it's more valuable than you know, than yeah. many other things. That, you know, parents spend money on. Yeah. So. Uh, and no, I think that I think that's 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 a great point. Sorry, did you were you gonna say something, Jacob? Before yeah, I. Said I Back off that, I, yeah, I think it's a bit of a flawed way of thinking. I mean, you know, why do we need professors then? I mean, I think we, we touched about this, you know, earlier in the meeting, but, you know, you mentioned yourself, you know, you got to do the legwork still. You know, let's say I never joined Wall Street Mastermind. Guess what? I'd still have to network. I'd still have to find a way to, you know, better my behavioral skills and technical skills. But, you know, it just helped me a bit more. And the community itself, you know, with the coaches and with the students, all they allow is, you know, someone to talk to, someone to kind of bounce ideas off of, you know, for example, since I joined, you know, one of the main reasons, you know, I didn't obviously have, you know, students around me that are going for it. That was definitely a, a big plus from Wall Street Mastermind. I actually got to, you know, surround myself with more, you know, like-minded people. I got to do mock interviews with them when if I asked one of my classmates at the time when I started doing mock interviews, a mock would be like, what are you mocking for? You know what I mean? So it's just like, I don't know. It's, yeah. Yeah. I don't hear for sure. Yeah, I I, th I think like I understand the parents that come from the standpoint of like, um, hey, I earn everything myself when I was coming up, and so I want you to be self sufficient too, um, because you know it builds character or whatever. Uh, but I do think that um, part of it is that um, one, the, the times have changed, right? I think like. For a lot of parents now whose kid whose kids are college age, you know, back when you were coming up and you were looking for a job, like the internet wasn't even around yet, I don't think, you know, like like the the proliferation of information, you know, in terms of like 
what you what, what your competition has at their disposal it's just it's a night and day difference right like back in those days if you said you wanted help like if there's no internet like where can you even go and get help you, you like go talk to your banker who's a uh, go talk to your neighbor who's an investment banker that lives you know right next to you like like it's just not the same thing right and so like even if you say like oh um like I didn't have any help back when I was doing this. Well, yeah, but your competition also didn't have any help because that was just the context back then, right? But that's not the context that that your kid is living in today, which is everyone has a lot of resources at their disposal. And if your kid is the only one who doesn't have any resources, then you're actually forcing them to, it's not even being self-sufficient. You're forcing them to fight with one hand tied behind their back, which they're 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 actually handicapped right um and then so that's one it's just like different different times um different contexts and different level of competition like as is the case with anything in life like typically the really desirable things like they only become harder and harder to obtain like getting into a ivy league school today is harder than getting into ivy league school 20 years ago right getting into uh the top banks today is harder than it was like 20 years ago. I, I mean, I recruited 15 years ago. It was like, I would get, I think about the candidate I was 15 years ago when I, when I broke in, like I would get blown out of the water by the kids that I'm coaching today because they're just like, Jacob is so much more prepared than I ever was back then. And that, that just is what it is. And that's okay. Right. And, and sometimes I think about like, my kid is, my kids are two and four. And I, I, I kind of like think about like, Hey, what's going to happen when, they're 18 years old or 20 years old. Like, what are they going to be doing? About it? I don't know. I guess by then AI will take over the world and nothing will matter. But, <laughs> but, but, but so like, I think that's, I think context matters, right? Which is, you know, you have to think about what your kids are doing relative to other people. And then the other thing too, is just like, honestly, if you really think about the successful people in the world, I don't actually believe that they all did it on their own. In fact, like all the most successful people had people that helped them along the way. All the successful people had mentors that took them under their wings or gave them advice or, you know, there, there, there's this book behind me, trillion dollar coach. Like it's about um, Bill, Bill Campbell. Who's this guy that coaches like the top CEOs in Silicon Valley, like the CEO of Google, CEO of Apple, CEO of, uh, you know, Microsoft. Like these are the most successful executives in the world and they have coaches to help them be better executives. And it's like, did they get to that level on their own? Like, no, right? Or even like sports, LeBron James, like did LeBron James become LeBron James on his own? Like, no, he had coaches, he had like trainers, nutritionists. He used, he pays for like whatever, th physical therapists, massage chambers, things that we don't even understand. Like he, that guy spends like over a million dollars a year on his body. And then everyone's like, oh, LeBron is like, so, so much longevity and he's like the greatest of all time. But it's like th the reason why he's that way is because he invests so much more into his body than like anybody else in the league. And do his peers say like, knock him for doing that and say, Oh, th therefore LeBron doesn't deserve it. Or are his peers are just like, yeah, LeBron's the greatest. <laughs> like, you know? So it's like, I, I think like, yeah, it it's a, it's a mindset shift of going from like, Hey, like if you don't, I think saying like, hey, you have to do everything on your own or else you don't deserve it. It's really only, the only thing that's doing is like holding your kid back, in my opinion, um, and, and not allowing them to live up to their fullest potential, you know? And, and to your point, like you already pay for their school probably. You already pay for their car. You already pay for all these other things. The same rationale there applies, right? So, um, okay, let's, uh, I know we're, we're a little over an hour. I want I want to wrap this up because I don't want to keep uh, keep keep you guys here too long. Um, I want to end on one last question, which is, uh, maybe for both of you. Um, we'll start with you, Jacob, and then Elvis. Like, but Jacob, what's one piece of advice? What's your best piece of advice now that you're on the other side of recruiting for maybe other students who are still recruiting or about to start going through recruiting, you know, maybe something you just learned along the way, 
as you went through this process that you felt like really made a big difference for you. And maybe you could think about that, think about that for a second if you want to. And then Elvis, I guess for you, maybe similarly, like what's one piece of advice you have for the parents whose kids are going through recruiting now or about to go through recruiting in terms of like what they can do to, you know, just kind of um, be the most supportive parents they can be for their, for, for their kids. So I, I don't know who wants to go first. doesn't really matter, but we'll, we'll, we'll end on that question. So, all right. So, yeah, I, 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 I guess this, this is something I even tell, you know, my fellow juniors at school, you know, sometimes when they ask me for recruitment advice and the reason why I mentioned it, I, I, I feel bad because I don't even remember the guy's name, but it was definitely a banker I spoke with um over my networking period. And, you know, I, I asked him one of those questions, like, you know, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? You know, what would you think about? And it mm -hmm. stuck with me. But it's basically, you know, at the end of the day, 99, or maybe that's too high, but a very vast majority of the competition, you know, all the candidates applying to these investment banking jobs, maybe they go to a good school, maybe it's, uh you know, mid-target or non-target if they're sitting in a super day room they probably know the technicals you know you know odds are if they got that far they know the technicals maybe they can answer their behaviorals you know pretty professionally you know well spoken you know just the right things to say how to say them i think um don't get me wrong i'm not saying not to allocate resources because at the end of the day i feel like those are kind of like it's the bare minimum. You better know how to do those regardless. Mm -hmm. um, there are definitely some that, you know, excel in um, different categories, but I think, and I, and I found this true to be with myself and with some other people, bankers that I've networked with, but I feel like another factor that isn't um, spoken about too much, um, even online even, um, is to kind of differentiate yourself more by leaking out your personality. You know, I feel like there's been times I've met other people in this recruiting process who I can confidently say they're probably smarter than me technically. I've seen these guys walk me through problems and math, you know, mathematical equations that I was like, whoa, I, I couldn't believe it. But when we mock or they tell me about their interviews or they show me a recording of their interviews, I'm surprised to see, I don't want to say monotone or robotic, but they're not, they're not giving so much of themselves. And, you know, if a bank or let's say you're sitting in a super day, and a banker asks four people or three people the same question, same technical question, let's say a basic question, and they will answer it with flying colors. They ask, um, ask them the same behavioral question. The behavioral questions are going to allow you to differentiate yourself a bit more. And it's it's more so than just answering, tell me about a time, you know, you dealt with something difficult. Yeah, I can tell you a, a, a bit diff a story that where I found a difficult project, you know, maybe working with someone who probably wasn't the best partner. But I think it's also about leaking out some of your personality. Like, are you smiling? You know, can you can you gauge the interviewer where you know you can maybe crack a small joke or something like that? You, you want to kind of release the personal aura you have because, you know, when it comes to those guys at the end of the day, sitting in a table saying, hey, you know what? These guys are all pretty technically adept. You know, I mean, the behaviorally, like no one really fumbled. But you know what? Like, this guy was smiling. Like, you know, he actually talked about his interests on his resume. Like, you know, this guy, you know, he kind of, at the end of the questions, you know, yeah, he has some professional questions, but he noticed something I said about my background and, you know, we kind of spoke about it. You know, he seems like a funny kid. He seems like a guy I'd actually love to sit around until 4 a.m. on a pitch with. You know what I mean? So I yeah. think it's very important to kind of leak that aura out. Um, Don't get me wrong. And I'll say it again. You know, behavioral cycles definitely studied them. Like I said, bare minimum, you better, you better know how to answer those questions when you're sitting on the other end of the table. But at the same time, train yourself, practice to make sure you can not only effectively answer those questions, but effectively, you know, kind of give out your own personal energy, you know, kind of give that off. I like, I like the, I never heard people use that term before, but you said personal aura. I like that. Um, that's a, uh, it's a good way of putting it. And I was actually that guy back, like I said, back like 15 years ago when I was recruiting, I was that guy that was super monotone and uh, didn't really know, like, I'm, I, I'm not a good, um, I'm not, I wasn't good at interviewing naturally. Uh, in fact, I was like pretty bad at it. And, uh, I kept getting rejected and I couldn't figure out why I was getting rejected. And then one day my roommate who had already gotten an offer, he was just like, all right, let's, uh, let's do a mock interview. This is why mock interviews are so important, by the way. He was like, let's do a mock interview and, uh, but let's record your mock interview. And like back then, dude, we didn't have iPhones or whatever. It was like, I think we re actually recorded on like a super old school, like camcorder. And like, after that, um, I watched it. I watched the recording of my own mock interview and it was like pretty late at night. And so I was like watching it and I was like, 
started dozing off on myself as I was watching my own interview. Cause I was so boring. Like I was so monotone and I was like, that was like a wake up call for me. Cause I was like, Oh damn. Like, this is what I sound like, you know? And like, I, I just had no self-awareness. And, and I think a lot of people don't have that self-awareness. Cause it's like, you just talk the way you talk and it's just, no, it just sounds normal to you, but you're not looking at yourself from like the other person's point of view. Right. And so I was that guy that you're talking about, but, um, but you're absolutely right. Like, what is an interview? But I think people overcomplicate this. Like, what is an interview? Like, if you really dumb it down to his like most simplest answer is like, you're trying to get the guy who's sitting across the table from you to like you as a human being. That's like what it is. If they like you and you mess up a little bit, they'll probably make a bunch of excuses for you on like why why you're still a good fit, right? If they don't like you and you nail all the technicals, they're gonna be like, oh, that guy's a stuck up like you know cocky kid who thinks he's he's a he's a know-it-all like not not a good cultural fit like that's my favorite when you get rejected because you're not a good cultural fit it actually just means they don't like you right uh, and so um so I, I absolutely agree with you it's like that that's like the the soft softer stuff um the, those soft skills is actually uh really 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 important which um speaking from personal experience doesn't really come naturally for everyone so uh for some people really really have to practice like i have to develop I called it like my interview voice, which is like not how I normally talk, which is more monotone, but I had like my interview voice, which is like, I had to put a lot more pep in the way I talk. And like, it was very draining for me, but like, you know, I could do it for 30 minutes at a time. It's not a problem. Right. So, um, anyway, uh, really, really great advice. Uh, Elvis, let's, uh, let's go to you. Um, yeah. So I mean, as a parent and uh, having a, you know, son or daughter going through this, I, I think it's, incumbent on us to become a little bit familiar with the process at least you know obviously not, not the material but at least with the process so this way you know you could you know keep them honest hey uh where are you uh are you done with your technicals are you done with you know where what module are you in you know and just be involved uh, at least in that sense because obviously we're not all you know not all parents are going to know you know like the the material but at least you know How's it going? Um, did you did you network? Uh, or even you know, like I, I know I helped them out a little bit with, and maybe this is a, I go a little overboard, but uh, I helped them out even like with putting together some of his network lists. Like I would go on LinkedIn, and you know anybody could do that. You don't need to be, you know, and and you know I think me being involved with him, you know, he's probably like okay, uh, you know my dad is. He's on me, you know. He, yeah, my dad is on. Me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And other than that, um, you know, support him in any way he can. Try to, you know, make his life easier. I, I mean, hope you know. I, I've been blessed. I have a good, I have a good son. You know, he, he knows what he wants. You know, you know. Another thing that I must say that I think timeline is important. The earlier you start, the I think the I feel like the better this process is. You know, I, I I see the comments online. I'm like, oh, I just decided to be an investment banker. I, I'm in, I'm a junior, <laughs> you know? And, and it makes everything so much harder. So if you support your, your child early on, if, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure they come up to, a lot of students come up to their parents like, oh, this is thing, what's your mastermind? I want to join. And, you know, they'll dance around it for six months or a semester, you know? And I think uh, maybe they already know they're going to say yes, but, you know, it's like any parents especially the old school parents like you said they go watch they go they go to a car dealership three times before they buy even though they know they're gonna buy it <laughs> you know and if you start start early you recognize what your, your son is trying to do it, it, it helps yeah for sure time time is the most valuable resource yeah. during recruiting. the data you have on your website and you, you said you know you have something like when you start as a freshman, this is the, the amount of kids that I, you know, that make it. You start as a sophomore, and you know, when you start as a freshman, I think you know it's much better than if you start as a junior. Yeah, and there's no magic behind that. It's literally just the kids that start freshman year are more prepared than the kids that start sophomore year, and the kids that start sophomore year are more prepared than the kids that start junior year, and so on and so forth. And that combined with the fact that, like I said, the best banks tend to recruit very early, and so the later you start. The fewer op the fewer good options you're gonna have left, right? So it's it's literally just math. It's not because we do anything different. In fact, we help everyone um, to the best of our ability, no matter when you come in. But it's just that like 
the later you come in, kind of the lower your ceiling becomes because, you know, we can't help you get a job at a firm that is no longer recruiting, <laughs> you know? So, um, but no, that's really, that's really good advice um, from you always. I think like, again, I said this in the beginning too, but, you know, we've worked with a lot of students now. Uh, we've interacted with a lot of parents. And I, I really think that, um, you know, you're one of the most uh, supportive parents that we've seen um, when it comes to kids, uh, when it comes to their kids um, and, and their career aspirations. And so, um, yeah, man, I really admire that. And like I said, my kids are two and four right now. So it's a while away from me, but I, I know that, you know, someday uh, they're going to get to the age where, you know, they start thinking about their careers. And um, I think just kind of seeing how you interacted with Jacob um, throughout this process, you know, gives me something to, uh, you know, look up to and learn from in terms of like how I, how I want to be there for my kids um, when the time comes. And so, you know, I want to thank you for that. Um, but yeah, with that said, guys, um, we're going to wrap up this interview here. We've been going for a very long time. So if you're still with us, um, uh, you know, if whether you're a student or your parent, you know, if you are serious about uh, recruiting for investment banking um, and you want to get the type of help that we've been talking about here, then, you know, I want to encourage you to at least like just do the due diligence of talking to our team. Doesn't mean you have to work with us. Uh, and in fact, we may or may not be able to work with you because to be honest, like we have to turn away a lot of people that we can't work with. Um, we, we will only, you know, ask you to work with us if we actually feel pretty confident that we can help you. Uh, obviously you still have to do the work. Doesn't mean that, you know, you come in, you don't do the work, then you're going to get in. But like, you know, um, it is a somewhat selective program. And so like, if you want to at least do the due diligence and have that conversation, we'll learn more about your situation, what your profile is or what your kid's profile is and what, what, what his or her goals are. And, what are the challenges that you guys need help with? And based on that, like, you know, we can walk you through like if we can help you and if so, like how, how we will be able to help you. Right. And, 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 and from there, if, you know, we mutually think it's a good fit, then obviously we can move forward, but if not, then that's okay too. Um, and so if that's something that you guys are interested in doing, then um, like I always said, it's very easy. Like you just go www.wallstreetmatchpoint.com slash apply. Um, the street is abbreviated to ST. So it's wall ST mastermind.com slash apply. And you'll be able to book a call on our calendar and uh, we'll be, we'll be happy to talk to you. And uh, parents, you guys are highly encouraged to, you know, join the call just so that, you know, you're informed and you know what your kids are doing and um, what they're getting themselves into. And then like Elvis said, uh, the more informed you are, the more you're going to be able to hold them accountable uh, and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, obviously we try to do that as well, but um, you know, sometimes it's not sometimes it's always good to, to, um, for the kids to have the parents in their corner as well, supporting them because, you know, you're a very important part of their lives. So uh, with that said, Jacob, Elvis, I want to thank you guys so much for um, honestly an amazing interview. I really enjoyed this and uh, really enjoyed working with you guys. Uh, not, not that this is the end of that. Like, you know, I'm sure Jacob will continue to, um, you know, uh, help you as you progress your internship and your full time and things like that. Like you're, you're obviously part of the family and uh, Elvis, you, you as well, but uh yeah, man, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Thank you guys for, you know, giving us the opportunity to just play a small part in your recruiting journey. And uh, it's been very rewarding for both myself and our team as well. So, um, yeah, just appreciate you guys. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I absolutely appreciate it. Yeah. Ab absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back with more of these for you guys in the near future. All right. Until next time.